Good morning, everybody. Happy Monday. Let's begin with what's possibly my favorite topic, vaccination. So we are seeing an amazing recovery in the city. We have a long way to go, but we're seeing a recovery. You go around the city, you can feel it. I was around this weekend, I, different parts of the city, incredible energy. Why? Because people got vaccinated. New Yorkers proved that they were gonna do everything to fight back. And the best way to fight back was to get vaccinated, get your family vaccinated. People went and did it. The numbers are astounding. And I want everyone to be proud of the fact that as of today, more than 82% of New York City adults have had at least one dose of the vaccine. More than 82%, that's an astounding figure. That's something every one of you should be proud of. And thank you to everyone who's participated. Now we have a chance to double down and protect more New Yorkers because of boosters. We're very, very happy that the booster shots are here. I wanna make clear from the beginning, we're gonna get different authorizations at different time. Right now it's Pfizer recipients. Folks who got Pfizer shots before can get Pfizer boosters now. Moderna will come along later, Johnson & Johnson, but right now it's folks who originally got Pfizer shots can get the Pfizer booster. We do expect those other approvals very soon for boosters. And the one I'm particularly excited about, as early as next month, the approval for vaccine for the 5 to 11-year-olds. That's crucial, and that's going to be so important for this city. But right now, for Pfizer recipients, here are the ground rules, and it covers a lot of New Yorkers. If you're 65 or older, you can get a booster. Adults with underlying serious conditions, you can get a booster. Uh, if you work in a high-risk setting, you can get a booster. You're ready. You can get them right now. Go to vax4nyc.nyc.gov. Again, vax4nyc.nyc.gov. Now, if you don't qualify or you got the Moderna or the Johnson & Johnson, uh, again, the original vaccination has a lot of impact. It's providing a lot of protection. And we do believe those authorizations are coming soon for boosters. So right now, we want to get boosters to everyone who qualifies, all the folks who had Pfizer previously and qualify. But we're obviously every single day continuing the effort to get folks vaccinated for the very first time who have not yet, getting second shots to people who need second shots. But again, let's be proud of New York City. Over 82% of adults have had at least one dose. That's a big, big deal. Now, I want to update everyone on uh, the school vaccination mandate. There was a court action uh, late Friday, temporary hold but not a full trial. There is going to be a full procedure uh, in the course of this week. And we are very, very confident that uh, the city, the part of education is gonna prevail because we're trying to protect kids, we're trying to protect families, we're trying to protect working people in our schools. Uh, we've been in court with this very same set of information, very same argument at both the state and the federal level. We've won previously. We expect to win again and quickly this week. In the meantime, for the next few days, the previous vaccinate or test mandate remains in effect. That went into effect September 13th. That continues. So everyone who works at Department of Education right now, you either have to be vaccinated or you have to be getting that weekly test. Uh, we expect as early as the end of this week that we'll be going to the full vaccine mandate. But of course, we will go through the whole court process. But here's what's very good news in the meantime, because we had that vaccine mandate coming, people responded. And in fact, even on Friday, even on Saturday, we saw the number of vaccinations in the Department of Education shoot upwards, 7,000 more vaccinations just on those days. So here's where we stand right now. Based on the information we have, and there's always a bit of a lag getting the most updated vaccination information, and sometimes it's also employees showing us vaccination information if they got it in another jurisdiction, if they got vaccinated in New Jersey, for example. But right now, here's our numbers. 87% of all Department of Education employees have had at least one dose. 87%, great number. 90% of teachers, 97% of principals leading the way. Thank you to everyone who got vaccinated. Particular thanks to the principals for their leadership. And we've gotten information from the United Federation of Teachers. They're doing their own tracking. They believe that for their members, teachers, paras, other members, that number is actually higher. They believe that number is closer to 97% for their members. So we would be thrilled as more information comes in to get that number up organically. But we're continuing every single day to tell folks Come get vaccinated. We're making it easy. It's available everywhere. Let's get ready for this vaccine mandate to take full effect as soon as we get through this court process. But look at these numbers already. 
for everyone, especially for parents and kids. This should be a real uh, sense of relief to see the numbers are already so high. And that says great things about our ability to have a safe school system and keep everything moving really, really well for our kids. Okay, now, we continue to address COVID every single day, the most immediate challenge. But the biggest challenge of our time, we have to address also every day, that's the climate crisis. And we know the climate crisis demands of us a lot of changes, a lot of new approaches. We also know it is manifesting as something that's shocking, more severe, more sudden, uh, type of weather that we've never seen before, literally in our lives, of kind of stunning, fast, brutal weather changes that have a horrible impact on our people. Let's talk about Hurricane Ida. Hurricane Ida hit Louisiana. I just want to remind everyone, everyone I've talked to since who works in the field of emergency response uh, is still a bit in shock that a hurricane could hit Louisiana over a thousand miles away, travel inland across the United States and still have the impact it had here in New York City, unprecedented. We had the highest amount of rain in an hour in the recorded history in New York City, but not from a hurricane that hit us directly, from a hurricane that traveled inland for a thousand plus miles. We're in a whole new world, and we have to act very differently. Now, once we experience this horrible impact, and we feel for the families, especially those who lost loved ones, and are still struggling from the results of Hurricane Ida, we knew we had to do everything we could to reach out to them. So we did an unprecedented outreach effort. We learned from the past, in this case, where the city didn't have as agile an outreach effort as it needed. We got together a strong team to go to the doors, go literally door to door in neighborhoods affected from our public engagement unit, from community-based organizations. Over 16,000 doors were knocked on in the affected areas to talk to people directly, get them help. Hundreds of thousands of texts, hundreds of thousands of calls immediately helping people. We've got uh, over 750 people, hotel rooms when they needed them. We gave out uh, well over 100,000 free meals. Also the debris, uh, folks' basements that got horribly affected by the flooding, they had to throw out so much. Sanitation department moved very quickly. Credit to the men and women of sanitation for really helping to get people back on their feet. This is a staggering figure. They picked up 17,700 tons of debris. We kept them going nonstop every day, uh, all day, all night, and they did a great job. Also, kudos to the City Cleanup Corps. They did a great job going in to help homeowners get stuff out that they couldn't deal with, especially senior homeowners. City Cleanup Corps really stepped up, helped make people uh, a little bit more able to deal with this crisis because someone was there to help them. So thank you to the City Cleanup Corps. We know this hurricane, and we've seen this with COVID, we're seeing it again with the hurricane, it, it hit in an unequal way. The folks who were hurt the most in many cases were not only uh, working class people, hardworking, struggling people, immigrants, but in many cases, undocumented immigrants. Over 5,000 undocumented immigrants, we estimate, were affected very directly by Ida. So we've launched an effort to support them with the New York Immigration Coalition and the Excluded Worker Fund. Uh, some folks, of course, cannot get FEMA support because of documentation status. Other families can because they have a mix of family members with different statuses. We need direct relief for the undocumented. So we're working with the state of New York right now for an effort that will launch at the end of this week to directly provide relief to undocumented New Yorkers affected by Ida. Uh, Governor's going to talk about this later on today. Our teams have been working closely. I want to thank Governor Hochul. This announcement details will be put out later, so I won't go into any detail now, but the city and state working together to reach those most affected and those who are struggling the most. Now, we learned from Ida that we have to do some very, very different things to even understand what's coming at us, to prepare for it, to alert people, to educate people, a whole different host of things and major changes in what we're going to do going forward for years and years to deal with a whole different kind of weather than we've ever known before. I want to remind you again, what hit us was what was called remnants of Hurricane Ida. I've never seen remnants of anything do as much harm and cause as much destruction. So this is a brand new world. And so we can't have business as usual. I convened a task force to look at this. Experts from within the city government, they consulted with really thoughtful, uh, smart folks, experienced folks outside. So the Extreme Weather Task Force had the mission 
put together a report that guides us in how to deal with this new reality. Here it is today, and it's up online now. It's called The New Normal, Combating Storm-Related Extreme Weather in New York City. This report is important because it talks about a whole host of things, some we can do immediately, some we can do over the next few months, some that will take years, it's true. But it's a real playbook, real game plan for how we're gonna address extreme weather. Now, it begins with some of the things we've started to talk about already. We're gonna have signage in new parts of New York City warning people in new ways of where to stay away when there's heavy rain. We're gonna have evacuation preparation. We're gonna be going door to door to prepare people for the possibility that there will be evacuations in the future. We're gonna be talking about travel bans, things we have very, very rarely used in the past, we're gonna have to use more often now. We're engaging community organizations that know their communities, particularly those communities with a lot of basement apartments, go door to door, talk to people in their own language, prepare them. So what we're realizing now is, even with the information we get from the National Weather Service, we're gonna have to be much more um, cautious because the warnings we get are not sufficient. So we're gonna be upgrading our own storm tracking and alerting systems, building our own state-of-the-art modeling. Uh, we have to do that here in New York City. Appreciate the federal government. I think they need to make a lot more investment. Uh, this is something Senator Schumer has talked about. A lot more investment in the modeling and the projecting so they can prepare people all over the country for these crises. But we've gotta do it ourselves in the meantime and particularly focus on being able to warn people as early as humanly possible, even the possibility that something really challenging is coming. And we've got to focus, of course, on the neighborhoods that have had the hardest times all along uh, in immigrant communities, low-income communities, communities of color. We've got to be especially focused on getting the word out, getting people ready. We're going to do a full census of all basement apartments in New York City so we have an exact way to do an outreach going literally knock on doors, educating people, but even in evacuation, knowing exactly where police department, fire department, others need to go for an evacuation. If we give that order, we have to be able to implement it immediately. Now, we've talked about what we can do to fix some of the underlying problems. It's gonna be real tough, that's the truth. Our sewer system was built for an entirely different reality in terms of climate. We've made some investments, $2 billion investment in the sewer systems in Southeast Queens, that really helped. But that was one neighborhood, one area. To do the whole city to rework all our sewers for this new reality is probably over $100 billion. That's only gonna happen with a lot of federal support. So we're clear in this report, federal support, state support, there's a lot of things we need to get to the bigger solutions, the truly long-term solutions. But in the meantime, we have very aggressive actions we're gonna take to protect people in the here and now. I want you to hear about what this means uh, from Folks who are on the front line, who saw the effect of Hurricane Ida, who have been fighting for a long time to make sure communities are protected. One of them first, he was my colleague in the city council when I was first a council member. I have tremendous respect for him. He's also been a leader fighting for the investments New York City deserves uh, from his position in the state senate. He knows a lot about the challenges of flooding uh, from the communities he serves in southeast Queens. My pleasure to introduce New York State Senator Leroy Comrie. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you this morning? Good, Senator. How you feel? I'm feeling well for a Monday morning. We're doing well. <laughs> thank you for having me on, and thank you for uh, talking about the relief that we need to help our homeowners for. Um, while we're dealing with the issues of the pandemic. Our small homeowners have been um, suffering and uh, the property tax abatement programs would give them a stable safeguard uh, at a time when many are still struggling. Um, at a time when many are still struggling to keep their heads above water. Uh, they've been working um, as, uh, as they had been told originally uh, to do opportunities to create opportunities for tenants for people um, and they have been uh, without relief for over 18 months now because of the court system because of the backlog uh, because of the moratorium uh, we have uh, and i have unfortunately in southeast queens and throughout southeast queens one of the highest foreclosure um, it, foreclosure rates in the entire state so anything that we can do to give property relief for 
all small homeowners would be great. So I want to thank you for embracing these bills and embracing this concept so that we can provide some type of um, tax relief for homeowners during this time. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Senator, I want to emphasize the point you're making. You know, as I mentioned, the need for federal relief, state relief. One of the things we want to explore immediately, this is for everyone's understanding as we talk about particularly what we saw happen to the basement. So the basement apartments, again, by our estimate right now, over 100,000 New Yorkers living in over 50,000 basement apartments that happen to not be legal, and that's a problem. But the solution is very complex and very costly. Uh, Senator Comrie is one of the people who is leading the way with us trying to figure out the solution, including it could be uh, tax credits to help homeowners convert these apartments to legal apartments. Now, again, it will take serious investment. Tax credits, public investment, both on top of whatever a homeowner can do. But a lot of the homeowners who were hit hardest by uh, IDA are people who are working class, have very few resources, can't make the investment. We're going to need the help from the state because if we can find a way to finance these improvements and conversions, it will help the homeowner, it will help the tenants in the basement apartments, it will make the situation safer. But we're going to need a lot of resources, and that's where the state comes in. Thank you very, very much, Senator. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Dwight. Have a great day, everyone. Stay safe. Amen. I want you to hear from someone who's really focused on these basement apartments, and, and it's a huge challenge, but trying to find ways to support the tenants who live in them, trying to find ways to meticulously do the work to get each and every one converted. It's going to take a long time, but it begins by focusing on wherever we can make an impact and then working for those bigger investments from the state and federal level to help us do it. Uh, she has advocated uh, for working people aggressively and looked for new solutions. My pleasure to introduce Councilmember Dharma Diaz. Good morning, my mayor. The pleasure is all mine. Representing the 37th Councilmatic District is definitely an honor for me and having been part of the conversation of the pilot program for almost five years now, I'm glad that the conversation has taken place so we have where to start from. Hurricane Ida was definitely not something that we expected. We lost too many families, uh, lost the, the, the displacement to too many families and too many deaths. I, I'm eager to see your optimistic and plan to putting forward Again, I, I thank you. I, I thank you for the holistic conversation we're having here today and what promises to be extremely successful. I would also like to thank, from the bottom of my heart, on behalf of myself and my staff, for OEM. I calling at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning, difficult times, Mayor as well, you responded to me on the spot immediately as I was struggling to trace my families. For me, as a council member, I'm just happy to be a part of the conversation and knowing the 37 council matic district has a pilot program and that my know I in conversations with my colleagues prior to either hitting there was strong support for basement apartments and bringing them to sustainable living as you as we all know new york city is in a housing crisis but the sooner we're able to move this pilot into reality less homelessness i feel new york city will encounter thank you again for this opportunity Thank you so much, Council Member. Thank you for all you're doing, advocating for the people of your community and helping us look for every solution. And, and now, in terms of the scope of this report, and I, it's really for anyone concerned about climate change and resiliency and how we protect people, take a look at this report because there's a lot of really powerful solutions, including powerful ideas about how to use open space, uh, how to use our parks as part of the solution, if we're dealing with new extreme weather and flooding, there are great ideas, some of which are already being implemented here in New York City, like the Blue Belt and Staten Island, some of which we are borrowing from our good friends, particularly in Holland, uh, legendarily has done great work on this issue, Denmark as well, Copenhagen. So really powerful ideas that are going to be implemented, some of them very quickly, to change the approach here. Some are going to take a huge amount of time and a huge amount of investment. But we have great thinkers, great allies who are pushing for these new directions. One of them is the New York State Director for an organization that has done tremendous good for this nation and, and saved so many extraordinary natural spaces, which is also part of the response to the climate crisis. So thank, thanks to him and everyone on his team for the great work they do. The New York State Director for the Trust for Public Land, Carter Strickland. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's an honor to be here today um, to um, talk about one of the leading challenges of our times, climate change. And tragically, we're meeting at a time when um, 13 New Yorkers have died, and that's on top of, of course, the New Yorkers who died during Sandy. And I will say Hurricane Irene, which hit uh, outside of the city, but in many ways was um, similar to Ida and affected uh, DP properties and communities uh, in our upstate watershed uh, where three people died. Um, you know, it, it is an unprecedented amount of rain. Um, you know, the climate is changing uh, faster than we can keep up with it. And it does take the kind of concentrated effort that we see in this report. Um, we certainly need to expand the capacity of the system. Um, and uh, certainly my uh, you know, former colleagues at DEP, um, uh, you know, are working hard on that. It, it takes a big effort. There's a lot of tools to help fight climate change. Um, uh, green infrastructure, of course, um, looking at high level storm sewers, um, you know, enlisting uh, property owners. Um, and we're happy to be part of the solution as a partner with the city since 1996. The Trust for Public Land has converted um, asphalt uh, schoolyards into green community playgrounds at 220 sites around the city. Um, there's certainly more to do. And uh, it's been a very productive partnership. We're able to be very flexible and uh, deliver these goods quickly and uh, less expensive uh, spent uh, at uh, low reasonable cost uh, with the city. Um, and so uh, the part of your plan that enlist partners like the Trust for Public Land, I think is very powerful. It's going to take an all of the above uh, type solution. And, and for those who might not understand what green infrastructure or converting asphalt to uh, green areas will do, uh, it will absorb rain. Um, you know, you, you certainly see flooding um, in areas that are forested in, in extreme levels, but it tends to be slower, um, you know, allowing the ground and the plants to absorb water, release it to the stu uh, sewer system slowly um, can help. And it has to work in coordination with gray infrastructure. And by the way, these green areas um, will also help address uh, one of the big killers, the big killer actually of climate change, which is um, extreme heat. Um, and uh, for the rest of the days, provide recreational spaces for New Yorkers. So it is a proverbial win-win, and we're looking forward to partnering with the city uh, in the future. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Carter. Thank you for everything you're doing with your colleagues. Thank you for your previous service to the city of New York. You know plenty about these challenges, but I agree, we can do a lot. And every time we get more of a challenge thrown at us, more information, more clarity on the, the dangers ahead, it's also a call to arms to do more. So we can, we will, and, and thank you for being a partner in this work. Everybody, um, we're coming up on our indicators as we do every day, but I wanna give you two updates before. One on uh, Rikers Island, and then some breaking news I wanna share with you about uh, the key to NYC uh, vaccine mandate. Uh, on Rikers Island, uh, we have put a series of new measures in place and we are seeing a real impact. We've got a lot to do, big challenges, but we are also seeing that with a lot of smart investments, a lot of forceful changes with some actual support from the state of New York, which is great and deeply appreciated. I thank the governor for that and her whole team. We're making a real impact. So for example, there's been real concern about the intake process. We changed the intake process. We added new spaces, new clinics for the intake process, more personnel. Uh, the goal is always to have intake and, and the necessary approach is to get under 24 hours. The average now is 10 hours for the entire intake process. That means people are not together in enclosed spaces. That also helps us address the challenge of COVID. Uh, we also are absolutely certain that we will end the triple shifts in the month of October. It never should have happened. There's a lot of reasons why it did, including, of course, COVID but it cannot continue, it will not continue. So we're seeing real progress. Very few triple shifts now, we wanna get rid of them all together. We're bringing a lot more of the correction officers back through a combination of incentives and tough standards, making clear anyone not doing their job will suffer the consequences. So we're seeing real progress. Very importantly, we gotta reduce the population in jail. I wanna give you perspective. In 2019, as recently as 2019, the population uh, in the jails with over 7,000. Uh, by August of this year, it was over 6,000. We're now down to 5,600. 
We believe in the coming weeks we'll be able to get this number under 5,000. I want to get under 5,000. I want to see the jail population go to 4,000 plus and keep going downward as much as we can, but get it under 5,000 in the weeks ahead. That in combination with bringing more and more officers back and bringing in outside help uh, from the NYPD, from private security, all of these actions are going to help us to make a safer, healthier environment. And of course, the great work that correctional health is doing to keep people safe, to help everyone, officers and inmates alike, having the lower population, having more officers present is going to help everyone. The goal is a humane justice system, a humane correctional system, doing everything we can right now to fix Rikers. But again, the real goal, get out of Rikers once and for all in the years ahead to the community-based jails. We did this work with the city council. We're going to see this change for the city and allow us to do right by people in the future. I said breaking news. I've got breaking news. There was a legal challenge to the key to NYC. Again, the mandate for indoor dining, entertainment, fitness. Uh, legal challenge uh, in the Eastern District Federal Court. Uh, and an attempt to get a temporary restraining order on the key to NYC. The Eastern District Court has denied that restraining order and the key to NYC once again has prevailed in court. So this is further evidence, another reason we're confident about uh, the mandate that we have for the schools. Every time there is a full court decision, uh, we find that these mandates are affirmed because they keep people safe and they help us stop a global pandemic and turn the corner once and for all on COVID. And speaking of which, here are our indicators. First of all, doses administered to date, amazing figure today, 11,416,837. Every day, I've been watching the figures every day, they remain strong. You're going to see another uptick this week uh, because of mandates coming into play. Also, of course, now we're going to start to see the boosters. Uh, so this is a very, very good number. Number two, Daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Today's report, 120 patients. Confirmed positivity level 26.32%. And then our hospitalization rate. This is, again, one of the most important numbers and a good one today. 1.07 per 100,000. Finally, number three, new reported cases on a seven-day average. Today's report, 1,320 cases. I'm going to say a few words in Spanish particularly on the storm response and the support we're going to provide for immigrant families, including undocumented immigrants. Muchas familias todavía están sufriendo los efectos del huracán Aida. Estamos preparando un fondo de ayuda directa para los neoyorquinos indocumentados afectados por la tormenta. Y continuando... Vamos a estar seguros de que todos reciben lo que necesitan para su seguridad. With that, let's turn to our colleagues in the media. And please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. Good morning. We will now begin the Q&A. As a reminder, we are joined by Dr. Dave Chokshi, Dr. Mitch Katz, Emergency Management Commissioner John Scrivani, Department of Environmental Protection Commissioner Vincent Sapienza, Director for Mayor's Office of Climate Re Resiliency Janie Bavishi, MockJ Director Marcus Soleil, and Chancellor Misha Porter. Our first question today goes to Juliet from 1010 Winds. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing today? Good, Juliet. How are you? Um, very well, thank you so much. Uh, I know on Friday you said uh, you had planned to go to Rikers this week. When will that be? And will press be accompanying you? I'll be going this week. Uh, we're going to announce as soon as we nail it down, but certainly in the next few days. Um, I'm going to go on the tour uh, with officials from my team. We're not bringing a whole big uh, media contingent in, obviously. This is a tour to update what's going on with all the initiatives we put in place, see what's happening, understand it, what's working, what more we need to do. Uh, but I'll certainly be speaking to the media after, uh, right there at Rikers, uh, once we lock down the details. Go ahead, Juliet. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Also, the street vendor in Bronx whose produce was dumped, was that the right way for city agencies to handle that situation? Uh, that was precisely the wrong way, Juliet. I'm, I'm really sad about this. I'm someone, you know, uh, my mom brought me up to finish everything on my plate, and I'd never waste food. And the notion that perfectly good food was thrown away is, it's absolutely horrible. So look, this shouldn't have happened. I, I don't blame any one person or agency. I think this is a classic thing of bureaucracies not communicating and not using common sense. If you got a lot of good quality food, let's get it to a homeless shelter or food pantry, someplace where it can be used. Of course, we would never throw it out. So um, I'm disappointed, and we're going to have to figure out some quick uh, new approaches to make sure this never happens again. Our next question goes to Ari Feldman from New York One. Morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing? Good, Ari. How you been? I'm doing well. Um, really interested to see this report. Um, uh, just go, starting to go through it and formulate some questions about it. But um, one thing that I was interested in asking about was that uh, you know th this this question of alerting people who live uh, particularly in basement apartments, especially in vulnerable areas. Um, my understanding is that the federal system, the wireless emergency alerts um, that that go right to your phone um, and that you don't have to opt into, that those are currently only available in English and Spanish. And I'm curious if, if whether or not the plan includes this, but how the city plans to create automatic alerts that will automatically show up on people's phones that may be geographically coordinated, but that will be in the many, many diverse languages that people who live in these basement apartments and in these uh, vulnerable parts of Queens, uh, that languages that they speak. Well, it's a great question, Ari. Um, and this is really about us using the technological capacity we have in new and better ways, but it also begins with that census that we're doing, which we've never had before. So uh, what I'd say to you is, right now, I think the combination that's outlined here, um, the door-to-door -door efforts by the community organizations in the languages of uh, each community, to prepare people, to get them acclimated, because it's one thing to get that report, or excuse me, that alert at the moment of contact, but we actually want people to think about and understand it in advance so they don't diminish that alert, so they really pay full attention. So that early work is gonna be crucial, and that's gonna start right away. Um, and clearly using the alerts differently, regardless of language, is crucial, and that's clear in this report. But I think you make a great point. Um, whether it's the cell phone alert or other forms of uh, communication, using a more sophisticated, more pinpointed approach to how we reach people in their own language. I think that's something we can do. I, I really do. And I would say uh, just I'll give that charge uh, to uh, John Scrivania's team at Emergency Management, uh, who is on the call with us now, to work that through and figure out how we can have dedicated approaches for each area in each language, uh, whether it's texting or a variety of other uh, modalities, because we got to get the message across urgently. Go ahead, Ari. Uh, thank you. Um, the other question was about uh, this idea to hire a private weather forecaster who can provide a quote unquote second opinion on what the National Weather Service says, service says is coming to the city. Um, what will that look like in terms of how the city balances reports from National Weather Service and from the private forecaster? How will those different reports be weighted? You know, who will have deter who will have control over how the city responds based on the different reports it gets? I'll make a parallel that I think is helpful here, Ari. It's a great question. Um, you know, after a, something very happen, horrible happened to the city, which we just commemorated 9-11, the city of New York made a determination to create its own intelligence gathering capacity and its own preparations to fight terrorism. It was not any disrespect for the other efforts, good efforts happening, state, federal, international. But we needed our own perspective given how important we are, how vulnerable we are. And it, thank God we created the Intelligence Division at NYPD. It's had a tremendously positive impact and it has often given us information we wouldn't have gotten any other place faster, better information, information that might have gotten lost in other bureaucracies. Bluntly, more urgent information because it was us protecting ourselves 
and thinking about our people directly. National Weather Service, they do good and important work, but we've too often found the reports were uh, too vague or too late, and we need something more urgent. So my simple summary would be having a private forecasting capacity to just be that second set of eyes, just like you go to a second opinion with a doctor, um, to tell us if what we're seeing from National Weather Service looks like the whole story, whether there's a possibility of things happening earlier, uh, higher impact, what level of alert we should go to, uh, someone dedicated to thinking from the New York City perspective, not the whole nation perspective. I think that's gonna be really, really valuable. Our next question goes to Andrew Siff from, from WNBC. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Happy Monday to you. Happy Monday, Andrew. How you feel? Uh, doing pretty well, thanks. Uh, uh, with regard to the now paused uh, vaccine mandate for school employees, the UFT is saying that this morning, teachers were, who were not vaccinated or staff who were not vaccinated got an internal message saying they're not allowed to report to the building and that uh, they notified you guys or the DOE about this at 6.15 in the morning and it wasn't fixed until 8 o'clock in the morning. What they're saying is this is further proof that you're not ready for this mandate to go into place and that if there is a staffing shortage, you are not ready to meet that. What is your response? Well, I will first say that that alert was a mistake. And, you know, there is human error out there, which is a very different question than the level of readiness. Um, it shouldn't have happened. It was a mistake. It was caught. It was corrected uh, and had very little uh, negative impact. So I'm not happy about it, but I'm glad it got fixed. And we just put some additional safeguards in place to make sure that no such alerts go without additional sign off to make sure they're the right thing. But to the readiness point, let's go over the numbers again. Uh, right now, 87% of all DOE employees, this is what we know of this moment, we know this number is higher. Again, 90% of all teachers, 97% of all principals. In fact, the UFT themselves says uh, amongst their members, who are a huge part of the school system, the number is closer to 97% of members vaccinated. I think the facts speak for themselves, Andrew. We, we're going to have the staffing we need. And the mandate has already worked because it's encouraged so many people to get vaccinated to protect each other and our kids. So. We're confident we're going to win in court. We're confident we're going to be able to implement this as early as the end of the week. Uh, and we're confident we're going to have the personnel we need. Go ahead, Andrew. Second question, zeroing in on Staten Island as an area of concern, we're hearing from folks like Joe Borelli and others that, that their staffing concern is specifically schools out there where they've been told anywhere from 13 to 50 people at one building might not be there. And separately, you may have heard about an anti-vaccine protest over the weekend at the Staten Island Mall where uh, people in the food court were, were shouted down. It was a, a, a sort of a strong show from an anti-vax movement. What are you planning to do, if anything, about a culture of, of opposition to the vaccine on Staten Island and its schools there? Well, I don't think there is a culture of opposition in the end. I think there's some people opposed, but it has not um, manifested as some bigger reality. So they, they went, they had a protest, they left. Um, that's that. It's, again, we're seeing that this number doesn't lie. Over 82% of adults in New York City have received at least one dose. And more will be, I guarantee it, uh, this week. So um, I think this sort of question of where is New York City going, where are the people going, it's already settled. The vast, vast majority have already made the decision that vaccination is the right thing to do. I mean, 82%. I like to say it this way, Andrew. Uh, when else have you ever seen 82% of New Yorkers agree on anything? So this is a staggering figure in Staten Island, all five boroughs. In terms of the schools, I've been asking the exact same question. Great minds think alike. Uh, we are not hearing so far any instance of a school uh, where the numbers of folks who will be out are more than we can address. And I, I think some people say that they are going to leave uh, when this finally comes into place, they're going to leave, but they have to make a really big decision. Do they really want to give up on their kids and the school community? Do they want to give up a paycheck? Um, I think a lot of people, when they really think about it, 
are going to realize that getting vaccinated is the right thing to do, and you're going to see those numbers a lot lower than some of the projections. The next question goes to Marla Diamond from WCBS 880. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. This is a question for you and uh, Mitchell Katz. Are you aware of any staff shortages at city hospitals, public and private, because of the state vaccination mandate that goes into effect today? I'll speak to the publics and say, and I want to give Dr. Katz credit, I think he's managed the situation very well. Um, I feel good about, very good about our ability to have the staffing we need in the public hospitals. I'll let Dr. Katz start and then he and Dr. Chossi can speak to anything about the uh, private hospitals that we're hearing as well. Go ahead, Dr. Katz. Thank you so much, sir. And I'm very happy to report that over 95% of my nurses are, are vaccinated today. So you were talking about 82% of New Yorkers agreeing, while 95% of my nurses have agreed, close to 98, 99% of my doctors have agreed. All our facilities are open and fully functional. Um, uh, I have not heard of any negative reports from uh, the private hospital system, but I confess I, I've spent today making sure that uh, health and hospitals is running well. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Dr. Choksi, want to add? No, sir, nothing to add. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Marla. Uh, on the Rikers visit, um, do you, do, would you have anything to say on um, calls from uh, advocacy groups, they say that you can use your executive powers to release more nonviolent offenders. Is that something that you plan to do? And also, have you met with the city district attorneys on the issue of bail? Advocates said at a protest uh, this week that it is still being set uh, at a high level for low-level offenders, a level of bail that they often cannot meet. Okay, two different questions there. Um, Marlon Bale, um, I talked to the various district attorneys quite a lot. Um, I think the important point is that judges are working within the law uh, to determine what's safe and what makes sense. Uh, so I, I don't hear reports that the advocates are raising. I'm certainly not hearing that from district attorneys. Um, I think right now the, the challenge is work within the law, but keep public safety first and foremost. Uh, in terms of um, the second part, Marla, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask you to repeat that, that other part of your question. Right. Can you use uh, your executive power to release even more um, people at Rikers uh, that do not fall under that, um, that it's the state uh, the, the what the governor announced uh, about releasing um, nonviolent offenders, the 191 nonviolent offenders. Can can you release more with your executive powers? Yeah, you said the key point is nonviolent. I, here here's the deal. With my executive powers, there is the ability to release certain people. It is a small number. We're going to talk about it as soon as we have finished the process with the district attorneys and YPD evaluating each case. I, I have been real adamant about I want to reduce population in Rikers quickly. We are reducing it as we speak. We're going to reduce it by hundreds more very quickly in the coming days because of work we're doing with the state, because thank God the less is more law is now at our disposal. Um, we're going to be able to drive this population down, I think, in pretty short order below 5,000. That's the key point. But the ability that I have to do further releases is small in the scheme of things compared to these big moves we're making. And also, I'm only going to release someone if I'm convinced it will not hinder public safety. So that's the balance we're going to strike. But we will be providing those specific numbers as soon as the evaluation is done. Our next question goes to Emma Fitzsimmons from the New York Times. Um, good morning, Mayor. Um, I was curious, are you concerned about um, shortages at, at private hospitals in light of this new vaccine mandate? And, and what are you doing to monitor that or respond to that? I will start, Emma, and, and obviously uh, turn to Dr. Choksi, Dr. Katz to comment as well. Am I concerned? Yes. But am I seeing evidence of any substantial shortage in New York City private hospitals? No, I am not seeing that at this moment. 
I think there are big challenges around the rest of the state for sure. But um, I think really good work. I mean, obviously, you've seen some of the hospitals that got out first with vaccine mandates have had extraordinary success getting their folks vaccinated. Health and hospitals, you just heard it from uh, Dr. Katz, putting that mandate in had a big impact. So we're going to be watching and be ready to work with the private hospitals if there is any problem. But I am not perceiving a major problem at this point. I think anything that we see is something that we'll be able to make adjustments to help address. Dr. Choksi, Dr. Katz, you want to speak to that? Yes, sir. Um, that's exactly right. Uh, and we are in touch with our colleagues uh, at the um, private hospitals, um, nonprofit hospitals, uh, to make sure that uh, they have plans in place, you know, with respect to adequate staffing. But as you said, what we've seen thus far, uh, for example, New York Presbyterian uh, had implementation of its vaccine requirement um, last week and, and saw uh, minimal to no impact in terms of patient care. And you just heard from Dr. Katz in terms of what's happening in health and hospitals. I do expect that uh, some places um, where uh, more healthcare workers remain to be vaccinated may have to make some operational adjustments particularly to ensure that, um, you know, the places that uh, staffing is most important, that's intensive care units or, uh, you know, the operating rooms are adequately staffed. Um, but, uh, you know, I do believe that, uh, that hospitals will be prepared to get through this, again, without a major impact um, to patient care. I'll just add on a personal note, you know, I was in my own clinic um, last Friday, uh, everyone that I was seeing patients with, uh, this was at um, Bellevue Hospital, uh, part of the health and hospital system, was already vaccinated. Uh, and I think that there are so many people um, who have been taking care of patients over the last two years who want to feel safe in the environments that they're in uh, and who are very supportive of these vaccine requirements moving forward because it's the right thing to do uh, for uh, not just their colleagues, but also the people that we're taking care of. Doctor, thanks, Doctor. And Doctor Katz, you want to add anything? Uh, no, sir. I, I totally agree with Doctor Chotsky. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Emma. And then, in terms of H and H, um, you know, Doctor Katz said that not everyone is vaccinated. Um, it, there are high rates of nurses and doctors, but my understanding is that less well-paid workers are vaccinated at lower rates. So, how many healthcare workers do you expect to put on leave today if they're not vaccinated? And let me just offer before turning to Dr. Katz, Emma, one again, this is uh, comes down to the hours really as people have to make a choice. I really feel strongly that many people, whatever previous hesitations uh, or concerns, when it comes down to the choice of are you really ready to give up a job that you've been a part of serving people, a community of people, are you really ready to give that up? Are you really ready to give up your paycheck? Um, a lot of people at that point say, okay, wait, I'll go get vaccinated. Um, I think that's a, a powerful reality we're seeing here. But go ahead, Dr. Katz. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I totally agree with your analogy. And I, when I did a town hall last week, I got a lot of positive feedback about reminding people that smallpox vaccination was also mandated. And because of that, I have the scar of taking vaccinia uh, which was a very dangerous vaccination that people actually died of. But happily, my children do not. They did not have to get vaccinated because we eradicated the disease. We do things sometimes in all for purposes that are greater than ourselves. Uh, I'm in terms of health and hospitals, we're over 90 percent now across all employees. Uh, and even today, uh, we are not putting people on leave if people are uh, not vaccinated, they're not going to get paid for today, um, but we're keeping lines of communication open and we're hoping that if not today, then by tomorrow, people will go and get vaccinated and uh, resume their posts. So I don't yet have any final numbers, but today's actions will be for people who are not vaccinated. They cannot come into our facilities uh, and they will not be paid for their work. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Our next question goes to Aaron Durkin from Politico. Hi, um, Mr. Mayor. Actually, Emma asked something similar, but I, I don't think I heard an answer to part of it, which is how many uh, public 
uh, hospital employees are, I guess, this category that you're saying are just not getting paid starting with today and not allowed to show up starting with today. It, is that correct? And what is the number? A good question. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, and Mitch, uh, with the qualifier that numbers are still being tabulated, um, and a lot of people are making those last minute decisions to get vaccinated as we indicated. Um, if you could give us sort of any kind of universe of numbers of folks that still are not resolved, I think. So, so Aaron, I'm modifying the question friendly amendment because I don't think we can say here's the exact number at this hour because it's changing literally as people are making decisions. But we can give you a little sense of universe. Mitch, what would you say? So uh, there are 43,000 employees for health and hospitals. We're over 90%, which means there are about 5,000 people who are not yet vaccinated. Uh, as of the best information we had last night going into this morning. But as you say, sir, I, I won't have better information until the end of the day, because if someone comes in for their shift today, um, we will send them to the vaccination clinic, and if they get vaccinated, they can then uh, go to work. Um, so I won't know until the end of the day. Also, uh, for people to keep in mind, because we're a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week service, not everybody is due for working today, this morning. So some people will get vaccinated today so that they can come in um, for an afternoon shift or an evening shift. But going into today, I had about 5,000 people who were not yet vaccinated. Right. And, and Aaron, to put in perspective, so you're now seeing at Department of Education and at Health and Hospitals, the number we have this hour is so high. And we, again, know that more people have gotten vaccinated. We still haven't gotten the report on or more people will choose to. But these are numbers that we can sustain. Uh, the point is when you're around 90 percent, um, clearly we can work with all the tools we have uh, to keep everything moving. So uh, there'll be challenges unquestionably, but I want to affirm when you're at that level of vaccination, uh, good organizations, good leaders like Dr. Katz can work unquestionably with the personnel they have to keep everything moving. And I would remind you, they were, all these leaders were lacking a huge amount of personnel at the height of COVID, because so many people were out with COVID, and they still kept extraordinary operations going in the face of crisis. Uh, this is a situation much more manageable, and we're gonna have the people we need. Go ahead, Aaron. Okay, thanks. Um, and then with regards to Rikers, when you say you're gonna bring down the population below 5,000 um, in the next coming weeks, so if I understand correctly, the Less is More Act, Governor Hochul already ordered those folks to be released, um, and the transfers to the state prisons are also happening. And, and you've been kind of reluctant to release the people under the 6A, um, you know, and, and bail decisions are, are judges and prosecutors. So how exactly are you going to get it under 5,000? By which mechanisms are you getting people out of there that hasn't already happened? Yeah, and, and Aaron, I want to affirm to you, thank you for the question. Uh, it's not reluctance, it's clarity. The 6A group is not a large group of people to begin with, and I'm only going to work with the recommendations from all of our public safety professionals, including DAs, as to which might be appropriate. It's just not gonna be a game-changing number. The big numbers are related to less is more. Uh, the ability to not bring people in the front door if they're technical parole violators. We're working to try and have them immediately diverted, either not be in any kind of incarceration or go straight to the state system, which is what really makes sense. Uh, a number of other people will be leaving for the state system who have been sentenced there. There are big pieces we'll be able to act on hundreds at a time over these next few weeks. And a lot of it is based on the cooperation with the state. So, you know, that's always been the missing link here. We didn't have a state partner. We needed a state partner. We now finally have that. The legislature provided partnership by passing less is more. Governor Hochul and her team provided leadership by signing it and then acting on it and working with us each day to find solutions. So those numbers will be going down by hundreds immediately in the days ahead. We have time for two more questions today. The next question goes to Michael Gartland from The Daily News. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Michael. Happy Monday. 
Happy Monday to you. Um, on 6A, uh, you, you said repeatedly it's not a large group of people who'd be affected when you're um, factoring out of violent offenders. So, so what is the number exactly? What is the estimated number of people that could be released under 6A? I'm not going to give you an estimated number. I'm going to give you an actual number when the process is completed, which will be, I think, this week. Um, every case is being looked at individually, including if there are, you know, some cases, remember, Michael, you've got someone in for one charge, but there's another warrant outstanding. There's a lot of specificity here. We're going to figure out what that number is and then announce it. But uh, to my understanding, it's dozens. It's not hundreds. Um, the real big impact is going to be these actions we take with the state where we're moving hundreds of people out in the course of weeks. That's where we're going to see the big population reduction. And again, I believe in relatively short order we can get the population under 5,000. Go ahead, Michael. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've seen a lot of examples in recent weeks of police officers in enclosed spaces not wearing masks. Um, I see it myself. I see people posting about this on social media all the time. And uh, this is something we've asked about before, but could you talk about what has made it so difficult to get police to put their masks on and what the city is doing to get them to put their masks on? Michael, I believe you saw what you saw, and I believe the folks on social media are reporting what they're seeing. I'm also watching all the time. I got to tell you, um, it seems a very different situation to me than it used to be, um, and I want to differentiate. I'm glad you said indoors. I agree with you. Indoors is where we need the most caution. Um, there are certain situations, if everyone is vaccinated and it's a small group of people, where it is safe to have a mask off indoors, but overwhelmingly for officers and for all public employees, uh, indoors is going to be a place where you keep a mask on. Outdoors, different reality. And again, a lot of our officers are vaccinated. And part of what we've emphasized is if you are vaccinated, you have a little more freedom, and we want people to understand that. So the message has been very clear to officers. I think the best way to handle it, Michael, is any individual instance. Um, if any members of the media see it, report it to us. We'll bring it over to PD for follow-up. We gotta just keep reminding people, have the supervisors do their job, get people to do the right thing. If someone seriously is resisting, of course, there'll be consequences, but I think it's about just persistent supervision to make sure it works right. Our final question today goes to Robert Henley from the Chief Leader. Uh, thanks for taking the call. Reducing uh, the economy's carbon footprint is a top priority of policymakers concerned about climate change, and reducing use of fossil fuels to move the workforce is on their list. For years, even the federal government has had successful pilot programs to promote remote work for back office functions like the Social Security Administration. Uh, the offices they have. In the last few months, you seem to have repeatedly said that New York City's use of remote work was disappointing during the pandemic. Do you think that there's um, any municipal jobs that could be done by a, a remote work or a hybrid? Look, uh, Bob, I want to emphasize a fair question. And um, I want to remind you, of course, when people are getting around using mass transit, uh, the impact on the, the Carbon footprint is obviously minimal because that mass transit's running anyway, and that's what most of our public workers use. But the, the fact is, I think there's a really valid discussion about the future of remote work in public service, but this isn't the moment to have it, in my very strong opinion. Um, we saw a lot of hard work. I want to emphasize, some people said, oh, are you saying that people who are remote weren't working hard? No, they were working hard. I'm sure the vast, vast majority were working really hard and trying their best. What I saw just absolutely consistently was that the quality of work, the quality of teamwork, the quality of communication was being undermined by the remote reality. And that the best we could do for people, the best we could do for the people we serve was to get our workforce back, get them coordinated, get them focused on the people they got to serve, get them vaccinated. But post pandemic, whole different discussion. I think for the new administration, it's a chance to look at this and decide what the future looks like. And there may well be some examples where remote work or hybrid work makes sense. 
It's just this is not the moment for that conversation from my point of view. We have an immediate crisis we got to address. Go ahead, Bob. So you mentioned the challenge in, in prior uh, get-togethers that the city's had to get its arms around the tens of thousands of illegal basement apartments. Over the years, in interviewing department building and FDA, uh, uh, FDNY inspectors, they've talked about the problem they have with the existing state law about getting access to buildings. Can you talk about that? And in light of the serious efforts you're making to reach these people, do we need to reassess some of these laws that have really hindered the city being proactive? Now, I'm really glad you raised that. The answer is yes. And I'm gonna send a message out. You're gonna help me with my managerial approach for the day, Bob. I'm sending this message out to all the good people who worked on this report. I know you're gonna be doing follow-ups each month, uh, providing progress reports on this, which is great. Include what Bob just said in one of your follow-ups because this has been a, a big issue. I think it has ramification for what we're talking about with the basements, but I think it has ramification for all the work that, for example, the buildings department does in terms of health and safety. I have been at town hall meetings where people say there's a problem, you know, the house next door, there's a safety problem, a health problem for our community, and we send over inspectors and the inspectors say they can't gain access. I've always thought that's ridiculous. It's not the inspector's fault, it's the law's fault. That if someone is there from the city to protect the health and safety of the surrounding community, they have to be able to get access. So I think you're exactly right. We should, and thank you, I, I will always comment and compliment when media raise things that we in public service need to know and need to act on. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we need to change city and or state law to give those inspectors access. And if they need support uh, from any of our public safety agencies in doing it, they should get it because a lot of what they do is what's gonna keep people safe. And if they can't get in the building, they can't keep people safe. So. Thank you, and everyone, look, as we conclude today, we got big challenges, we're still fighting back COVID, we've got this huge new challenge from climate, but I, but I urge everyone to look at this report because it's an example of what New York City does. We get hit with something, we get right back up, we find new solutions, we move quickly, we are bold, that's who we are as New Yorkers. Uh, we do not take no for an answer. So whatever is thrown at us, we're gonna find a solution. Uh, people are doing that right now with COVID by getting vaccinated. Thank you to the 82%. Let's go get the 18% now and finish the job and beat COVID once and for all. Thank you, everybody.